the exhibition about the history of design and wear of military uniform. I am Fran, I'm the training curator here at Bob and Keith and I curated this exhibition. We're looking at the history of the design and construction of military uniform and uniform really started at the end of the English Civil War as such as this picture of a reenactment here um, where you can start to see the use of colour to recognise different uh, soldiers of different uh, sides. So it was this time in 1649 that they started officialising it and it was a way to again recognise who was on your side and who wasn't um, and later has been moved towards uh, working out which is like rank and regiment you're in using insignia, so different buttons and pips. So as you can see here, the cuffs of this jacket are in a buff colour. So it's a, a leather that is called buff because it was made of buffalo. And this was the colour for the Duke of Cornwall's light infantry at the time. So a way of recognising which regiment you were in amongst all of the other red jackets. And another example of colour coding in uniform is in this jungle hat from the 1960s. So these all have colour bands around as a way of like monitoring uh, soldiers' movements. So they would radio in two camps saying there's like a blue and two oranges coming in and it's just a way of finding out where people are and also recognising your fellow soldiers. So now we've talked about the purpose and colour coding of uniform, we need to start thinking about why they use certain colours and materials. So here in this display case, I have separated out wool, cotton and leather, which are all natural materials, which are mainly being used by the British Army for their different properties, such as breathability and waterproofing. And I want to show in particular these pantaloons. So these were worn by dispatch riders, such as these. Uh, in the Second World War and they're made of cord and they have reinforced lining and it's just an example of how the kind of standard breeches or soldier breeches have been adapted for the use of dispatch riders. So now we've spoken about the choices of materials and fabrics then there was a lot of consideration that went into the colour and pattern of different uniforms throughout the ages. So we begin with the red tunic, which many think was actually used to hide blood stains, but really it was just because it was a cheap dye at the time, um, affordable, and helped them kind of stand out when they were trying to spot their other soldiers in amongst the gunpowder smoke on the battlefield. Now this has now kind of become a signature of the British Army. Um, so originally they used madder root, which known as, they were known as madder red. So it created this kind of pinky red dye. Um, and this one, being from 1881 is actually more of a scarlet, so it's made out of cochineal, the bug dye. And then we move on to khaki, and in between these two, we have kind of the early form of khaki here, which was at the turn of the century, so during the Boer War, for example, where they were doing foreign service and they needed a slightly lighter, cooler uniform, but also something that would help them camouflage a bit, as uh, what the change in weaponry occurred at this point. So. No, you no longer had to be so close to the enemy, so you were able to hide because um, you could shoot from further away. And also there was less smoke on the battlefield as well, so you could use camouflage to your advantage at that time. And then we move on to the 1960s, which is when university would come across uh, camouflage across all of the regiments and ranks. So this is known as DPM, so this is Disruptive Pattern Material and it's made to replicate this sort of landscape, so particularly temperate climates in Europe um, and it kind of started becoming a bit more redundant as uh, conflict moved to different areas of the world so that's why in 2010 we moved to MTP which is this multi-terrain pattern which as you can see uses a mixture of different lighter colours so it can be used in like building compounds and it's just more universally effective across different environments. So these hats and helmets are a really nice example of how design has been used in different ways for different purposes. So we've got some ceremonial helmets and hat caps as well as more practical ones. So you can see the use of colour in the jungle hat and in the foreign service helmet, which is kind of the beginning of khaki being introduced into the army. And then we have these more ceremonial full dress helmets and the shako. 
Um, the shape is particularly interesting as the form over time has changed. So this is this one is from about 1861 to 1869, and it was influenced by the French kepi. So a lot of the armies around Europe were influenced by whoever they thought were the best at the time. So the British army wanted to appear like the French, um, so they took influence from their hats. But as you can see in this diagram, how the shako has changed in shape. So it started off being a very tall hat, then it had a false front, and then you moved to this more kepi style hat, like this one up here. So we've spoken about the colour, the pattern and design of different uniforms and here in this case really looks at the details and the kind of visualisation of uniforms. So we've got here along the top sealed patterns. So these are the official pattern to say this is what this badge should look like and is sealed with a wax seal as you can see across these. Um, they often say war office on them. And then the writing on the back is the writing from the manufacturer. So a manufacturer will have a copy and so will the war office. So they both agree that this is how the certain badge should look. And the first seal patterns were introduced in King Charles I's reign. So at the same sort of time as the end of the English Civil War, when they were introducing this kind of formal uniform across the British Army. And as you can see, these sort of regulations trickle down all the way to buttons to other forms of insignia such as cap badges, helmet badges and shoulder titles. So now we've spoken about the official patterns of uniform, we can move on to talk about who actually made them. So the, the art of tailoring has changed a lot in the British Army, so there were master tailors at one point who were based in the barracks, generally in the 19th century, and they were there to alter and fit garments to the soldiers themselves. And then there were also regimental tailors who were the official tailors who would make the uniform for the British Army. And also, at that time, officers were allowed to employ their own tailors, but they had to conform with those dress regulations that they were given. Um, but also they tried to centralise the manufacturing of army clothing in the 1855 to 1932. So in Pimlico, London, a factory that for army clothing was established, which helped centralise this. So when the army had this centralised manufacturing of uniform, they employed master tailors to to learn how to draft these patterns as part of a training programme. So here, this book is from 1905 and is from W.R. Richards, who trained at the Army Clothing Factory in London in 1905. Okay, I think just a and here is his certificate for the training. And this book contains all of the patterns that he's drawn out as part of that, that training to show that he is capable of drafting all of these different types of uniform patterns. And what is particularly interesting about this book is that the tailor himself has put in a letter of recommendation on his behalf uh, for a job in Cornwall. So this letter is written in 1919 and asking to be transferred to the number four Devon and Cornwall Fire Command as the tailor. So now we have spoken about the whole production of army uniform. The uniform has been made and fitted to the soldier and now it becomes their responsibility to care and maintain for it. So that is what this section here looks at. So in 1894 clothing regulations within the care and preservation of clothing section all about washing flannel shirts, worsted socks and woolen goods, they state. The water in which the articles are washed should be lukewarm only. They should on no account be put into boiling or even very hot water as it tends to shrink the material. Yellow soap only should be used and the use of washing powder is prohibited. 
After the water has been completely wrung out of them, the articles will be well pulled out before drying.